Thank you very much to everyone for attending this evening's uh, salon event. I just want to uh, introduce myself. My name is James Thompson. I'm the Executive Director of the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute at the University of Manchester. I'd like to thank Manchester Salon for uh, inviting us to do this collaborative event and also to the International Anti Burgess Centre for welcoming us here to this uh, fantastic venue. Um, we have uh, three uh, really interesting speakers uh, tonight to talk to you about how to get away with murder. Um, and each person is going to speak for about eight or nine minutes about this topic, about the topic of genocide more broadly. Um, I'm going to be uh, an outrageously authoritarian chair for the uh, primary reason that we want this to be as interactive and participatory as possible. Uh, each person will speak for about eight or nine minutes. I don't know why I was told eight or nine rather than ten, but clearly there must be a really clear reason for that. Um, and I will be strict. Uh, but at the end of that, there will be an opportunity for yourselves and the audience to ask questions, make points, make contributions, uh, to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, after an audience discussion, at times I will return to the table to ask for some responses, and maybe at the end we'll have a sort of short contribution from each person to wrap up. Uh, because it's an informal event, I ge I'm guessing that the bar is open probably throughout, so don't feel that we have to have a break because many people need to get up and move around. That's absolutely fine. Um, you can tell I'm being sort of quite light-hearted. I'm my job as a chair to smile and welcome everybody, but of course we are talking about an intensely serious topic that is difficult to talk about. Um, so I apologise if, if already you think I've set the wrong tone, uh, but it is important that we're open and free to speak about this subject within these walls as best we can. We're talking about something that uh, a French writer, Gérard Prunier, Prunier, has called the G word. Uh, and just the fact that he calls it the G word shows that it's a sensitive topic that people are sometimes fail to speak about. They actually fail and uh, are worried about saying this word. For people who are familiar with the genocide in Rwanda, many people say that it was the failure of the international community to actually utter the word genocide that caused some of the terrible implications of that event. And subsequent uh, massacres, uh, terrible international events, People have struggled around the term, or uttering the term genocide, because of the implications and, in terms of international law, perhaps the obligations that start to be triggered when people say that word. So the saying of the word, let alone the content of the acts that it's meant to describe, is one of the controversies that we're going to be uh, looking at tonight. Um, we have three amazing speakers. Hopefully, part of the reason that you're here is you might have read on a website or read somewhere who they are already, so I'm not going to do a lengthy uh, introduction. We have to my left Professor Mukesh Kapila, who we're very happy uh, to be working at the university at the moment, but he uh, is currently a special representative of the Aegis Trust. You can see a banner from the Aegis Trust at the back. Uh, but also, he was previously the Under Secretary General uh, for the International Federation of the Red Cross, uh, and also works um, uh, uh, strongly in uh, Sudan at the time of the Darfur crisis, and that's one of the perspectives that we will be bringing to the panel tonight. Uh, we have Vanessa Pavovac to my right, who is a lecturer in uh, international relations at the University of Nottingham, who is also uh, another person who's written a book tonight. We've seen a lot, we can see a lot about one book, but there are a few books from the great authors on our table tonight that we will hear about. Uh, and Vanessa has worked, um, amongst other things, uh, for the UN Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia, so brings her experience in, in that forum to, to this event. And finally, uh, last but uh, definitely not least, we have, uh, we always have an honorary medic, uh, and this is uh, uh, Dr. Roni Brownman, or Professor Roni Brownman, um, who is uh, perhaps best known for being former president of Médecins Sans Frontières in uh, France. He was president of the organisation between 1982 uh, and 1994, uh, and himself has made uh, many comments uh, internationally, publicly, about the politics of genocide and the politics of describing certain international events as genocide. <coughs> that is enough from me. Uh, I'd like you to give a warm welcome to our first speaker, uh, and the clock, Mukesh, starts now. <laughs> <laughs> That's 20 
20 seconds of his time. Yeah, you already <laughs> wasted 20 seconds of my time. Right, thank you very much. Very glad to, to be here. Uh, our subject is about getting away with mass murder. And uh, I hope to tell you, those of you who are aspiring mass murderers, uh, how you can get away with it. So this will be a how to commit genocide uh, guide. Uh, and this is based on my unfortunate experience. I didn't set out to uh, be a witness to mass, uh, mass murder, but have finding myself in, uh, in uh, Rwanda as a British government uh, official in the, in the 90s, 10 years uh, um, next year. Um, uh, in the last year, the last uh, century, I've been in Srebrenica, in, in the Bosnian War, and then finding myself as the head of the UN in, uh, in Sudan. And that's the appropriate time to give a plug for the book. Please do get it, so otherwise, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's uh, at the back, David, he's got 10 children, he can't meet, make it meet in films unless you buy the book from him. Okay, right. Why is genocide such a difficult political uh, issue? What are the sensitivities about it? My two conclusions on that, after some 20 years of grappling with the <coughs> situation around the world where these crimes of humanity have been committed are, that firstly, it is because the propensity to commit evil is very much part of the human condition. And uh, we know that genocides have taken place in every culture, in uh, every uh, age, and uh, uh, in, in different contexts, but they have all had certain features uh, in common. So a propensity, a human propensity to commit evil um, is uh, by definition therefore makes it very, very difficult uh, to deal with uh, at an institutional or political uh, level. A reason for that also is that uh, our conceptualization of this uh, word, so much shaped by the experiences of the Holocaust and the Second World War, the, the terminology of genocide and so on, is fundamentally a definition which is, uh, which is really uh, uh, for pathologists and archaeologists. Uh, in other words, genocide is always declared after it's all over, when all the conditions have been met. And then the people can say, yes, that was genocide. And the convention has virtually no preventive properties uh, at all. Not a single genocide in history uh, um, uh, has ever been prevented. So, uh, yeah, but I'm sure my colleagues might disagree with that, but I look forward to the dis disagreement. And that makes it very difficult. Thirdly, I think uh, we have to say that if the Genocide Convention requires the declaration of genocide to be accompanied by uh, action. And because of the complexity of the circumstances uh, which accompany the genocidal act, uh, people are reluctant to use the G word because they don't they won't find it difficult to respond. And therefore, the problem with our inability to deal with mass atrocities and crimes against humanity may well be the definition of the word or the way that it is used and therefore it has a disempowering effect at least in the modern world. It might have been fine at the time the phrase was invented and that it was fine in the post-Nazi world and such like. But in today's modern world uh, where we have a complex social, economic, political and other factors that impact on, on the, the execution of crimes against humanity and the, and the prevention, uh, it's, uh, uh, is it still a useful word? Uh, I think the word is useful, but I would like that to be debated. But I think certainly we, are, uh, we should be looking into revising the definition of the term and modifying it in, for the period ahead. But let me share with you what I was mainly going to say, and this is the, my 12 uh, tools for committing genocide or how to get away with uh, genocide. And these are drawn from my own experience of trying to draw the world's attention to the circumstances in Darfur where I was a UN head and uh, the events were unfolding, which I won't describe in great detail. Uh, they're all uh, outlined in the book. But as in, in 2003, when uh, the circumstances on the ground uh, unfolded and uh, great crimes were being committed in Darfur, and I traveled the world, I came to London, I went to New York, I went to all the uh, Security Council countries, the UN, Kofi Annan, and so on, who was my boss, uh, to say terrible things were happening in, uh, in that world. Here are the 12 reactions that, uh, that I got. The first was uh, cynicism. Uh, what do you expect in Sudan? And for, to, for Sudan, you can substitute Syria, Congo, or any country you like. Uh, it's a nasty place where people have been doing nasty things to each other for so long. What's different here? The second excuse people uh, get genocide deniers. 
is futility or helpless, helplessness. Oh, it's over now. It's over. The genocide is complete. There's not a lot we can do about it. It's finished. What's the point of intervention? So it's futility or helplessness. <laughs> the third excuse uh, people uh, give is denial. Surely, Mukesh, they said to me, the situation you described is not so bad as you made it out to be. One of them even said that I was a dramatic person and uh, uh, prone to hysteria, fair words. Uh, and I was prone to exaggeration, to gain attention. And uh, therefore, the situation wasn't as bad. The fourth, is, the fourth excuse people give is ambiguity. Well, it might be genocide, it might be this, it might be mass atrocity. What's the difference? What's the difference ethnic cleansing and, and genocide anyway? And uh, this, that, and the other. So what you do is you blur the, blur the boundaries. Fifthly, prevarication. You've got to be patient. Complex matters. You know, people have been fighting in, uh, in that part of the world for uh, centuries. It takes uh, a long, long time to understand it. We will have to commission analysis. Anthropologists will write on it. Consultants will write many reports on it. Uh, Diffid will do its uh, you know, studies on, uh, on it. And then we'll think about it, how to re respond. Prevarication. The sixth excuse people give is risk aversion. It's too risky to intervene. And by the way, if you intervene in a situation like in that case, I'm talking about Sudan in 2003, 2004, um, uh, it might make matters worse. Uh, uh, President Bashir, who was the genocidal uh, head of the regime, he might actually get very annoyed with all the pressure on him, and he might actually lash out even further. He might make the situation worse. The seventh excuse is destruction. You know, we've got many problems uh, uh, to tackle. And people in policy making rules in particular have this tendency to what's been called the inertia of busyness. And so, and so what happens is that, you know, and we all know this, those who have uh, ascended any, any uh, uh, levels of authority, is that the higher <coughs> you go, the greater the complexity of the problems that land on your table. By definition, if you're the prime minister or the president or whatever, uh, it's basically all the problems that are insoluble at any lower level. And these people are still human, uh, human beings at some level, the Margaret Thatcher, there's some division of opinion on that uh, subject. Uh, but, but, however, the point is that the more complex the problems, the land on the policy makers' table, easier it is to deal with them by actually not doing anything. It's what has been called the inertia of uh, busyness. And, uh, and anyway, the, world, the, 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 uh, the priorities are changing, uh, the world is volatile, new cycles give you two or three minute sound uh, bites as I found two my own course this morning on the Today program. And in those two or three minutes, you're going to explain you know, the whole of meaning of life. And uh, that basically dictates, therefore, you know, uh, people's appreciation, destruction. The uh, eighth excuse people uh, give is bug passing. It's not my job. Uh, you know, uh, I'm a doctor, I'm a teacher, I'm a humanitarian worker, I'm a shopkeeper, I'm a pope, I'm a priest, I'm a whatever it is. It's not my job. So always, uh, what to do goes on to become someone else's job. And the more complex a problem, the greater the buck, the buck passing was my, uh, was, uh, my experience. So the Americans said, talk to the Brits. Uh, the Brits said, talk to the French. The French said, well, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, we have to be this, that, and the other. And by the way, have a very nice lunch. <laughs> and then they all said, it's African solutions for African problems. How come the world's biggest problems, which is what you're talking here about, get subcontracted out to, to uh, when the world's biggest institution, the UN, created in the aftermath of the war and all the rest of it, can't solve it, says, right, Africans will now solve it. Crime against humanity in one place is a crime against humanity, against all humanity in all places. And yet the way we deal with some of the worst, most difficult problems is not deploying our strongest instruments, but actually we go down the betting order. And this is what's happening at the moment. Ninth excuse people get, and I'm really finished. Two minutes. Yeah. Is uh, purity, moral equivalence. Uh, like in Syria, it's going on at the moment. Oh, Assad was a bad one, but now the rebels are Assad. They're linked to Al Qaeda. They're all as bad as each other. And uh, what happens with, uh, with this confusion of uh, purity, if you like, is that uh, it uh, disempowers you. They're, you know, plague on their houses. That kind of, uh, kind of excuse. The gray, the blurry. As someone said about Kofi Annan, in fact, you know, if you want to find the gray spot between black and white, between uh, the, 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 the convenient, uh, convenience between truth and falsehood, Kofi is your man. A good appropriate job for the head of the United, uh, the United Nations. And they gave him the Nobel Prize. Tenth, excuses deference to authority. And, uh, with, and you know, we have this whole industry at the moment, which is about awareness raising and such like. 
and yet there's no specificity in terms of the response. Many NGOs and advocacy organizations get a good livelihood out of this business of raising people's uh, ire and their excitement. And, but they, of course, have no responsibility to do actually any, any, anything. They don't actually make any, make any recommendations. The eleventh uh, uh, excuse people give is calculated naivety, which is actually believing the genocidal dictator. So, uh, and this happened. You know, uh, Kofi Annan goes to sit in a Darfuri refugee camp, speaks to the leader of the Darfuri refugee, and says, yeah, "Everything all right? You're getting food, water, everything fine?" He says, yeah, "Yes, sir, everything is fine." So I said, "Well, look." And then he comes back to New York, says, "Ah, I spoke to them, and they said everything was fine." Uh, and uh, so that calculated, <coughs> if, you, if you like. Uh, is uh, often a response because what happens is leaders revert to childlike uh, forms when they're faced with problems they cannot confront because they don't have the, the, the complexity of maturity to them. Finally, and the most important reason of all why this is politically difficult and why genocide and crimes against humanity will happen again and again and again and again, um, and we should be honest about that, is because of what uh, uh, someone has called empathy deficit. If you don't actually feel you know, if you talk to a Holocaust survivor whose family was in Auschwitz and so on, you understand, they understand, nothing needs more to be said. But not all of us have to be put in a concentration camp and be tortured, uh, or watch our loved ones be tortured before we can internalize it. So that's our greatest challenge. It's not the politics of it, it is the humanity of it. And of course, it's the politics of humanity and the humanity of politics, in a way, which I feel is where the greatest uh, uh, thinking needs to be done, if we are to actually uh, move forward in confronting the evil uh, against the tide of evil, so final plug for the book, um, uh, and, make, and move forward. Thank you. <laughs> Amazingly close to being on time, Mukesh. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, a quote from Mukesh. Uh, he said in an interview to the Aegis Trust, we can argue the words, but that will be no consolation to those people who are affected. And one of the interesting things tonight is we are arguing the words, and we do need to think about what consolation this is, this sort of event is, to those people affected. And the answer to that is to Vanessa. <laughs> um, I do think we need to argue words, including words like genocide. And obviously, by definition, uh, 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 court processes involve uh, uh, argumentation. It's not, uh, 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 the, the very process uh, uh, involves discussions of particular uh, uh, events and meanings and interpretations. And just as uh, other areas of life, law as an institution can be both progressive and oppressive. And just as law can be both progressive and oppressive, so can international humanitarian law and international human rights. Uh, uh, so while law uh, has its own specific internal norms and different legal traditions have their own specific uh, inter internal legal norms, but nevertheless, the character of law in a at a particular historical juncture will be influenced by uh, 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 the particular political forces. Now one of the key issues around international war crimes tribunals has been a concern for the bias of national law and legal processes. Hence uh, uh, advocacy around international law, sort of international law against power politics. But international law and legal processes, just like national processes, are also shaped by political forces, notably the politics of the great powers, and actually may be even more remote from the people and less subject to legal restraints of the different national legal systems. And we know the dangers of this in terms of international tribunals as big as justice, uh, as David Schaefer, uh, a key architect of the 1990s uh, international legal developments, uh, US and master uh, at large for war crimes uh, acknowledges that the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals, uh, when we look back uh, at them, uh, uh, were victims' justice, not victims' justice. <coughs> um, when we look at, um, trace back the concern for genocide, and I think this is perhaps where I'm 
uh, uh, would disagree with Mukesh. Actually, I think what's really surprising of the last uh, two decades is the G word has been everywhere. Now it's been everywhere, but, but in specific contexts. But, it, but what's been really striking is, is the readiness uh, uh, in particular contexts for uh, 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 an interest in, in genocide. Uh, and you had uh, a specific development backed by cash uh, uh, backing a concern for international uh, 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 justice. Uh, 2.3 billion is estimated to be the cost of the ICTY, the Ad, Ad Hoc Tribunal, uh, to, uh, up to uh, 2014. Uh, so a considerable uh, part of the UN uh, uh, um, budget went uh, uh, and, and other budgets uh, contributed to the uh, ad hoc tribunal of the international uh, uh, tribunal uh, for former Yugoslavia. Um, so it's, um, uh, if you like, the genocide hasn't just been a, a normative concern, it's also had uh, 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 practical consequences since the 1990s. And also a context where there's a desire to uh, uh, break with the problems of Nuremberg and Tokyo and seeking to move to victims justice. But here we come to a striking picture where it's called the Cold War focus of, of advocates was very much focused on charges against uh, the US and other great powers. Uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Richard Lifton were concerned over the US over Vietnam. Uh, or uh, a key concern of the General Assembly was apartheid uh, and South Africa. Um, uh, but what, what's really striking about the post-Cold War, that the focus by the US, uh, and I would uh, uh, emphasise the US as a key uh, um, actor here, um, has been, uh, and other Western powers, has been on non-Western or not, uh, uh, non-aligned countries, primarily uh, uh, Africa, but notably not apartheid South Africa. Um, all right, ad hoc tribunals, I'm just conscious of the time. You've got another six minutes. All right, um, all right. ad hoc tribunals at the ICTY and the, so we had, uh, in this context, uh, in the 1990s, we had the setting up of the um, ad hoc tribunals, the ICTY uh, and the ICTR and the Security Council. Now their remit was peace and reconciliation. So has that mission uh, been fulfilled? And in the um, uh, interest of timekeeping, in a word, I would argue no. Peace, has it, did it promote peace and prevent crimes for the ICTY um, uh, uh, when I was working there? Um, uh, the Srebrenica massacres took place uh, uh, when the ICTY had already been set up. It had already begun. Indicting people. So the ICTY uh, failed to stop Srebrenica. We think about the Rwandan court. The Rwandan court may have prosecuted uh, people for genocide in, Ru in, in Rwanda, but it certainly didn't uh, uh, make peace or maintain peace. It failed to stop the Congo conflict, which uh, uh, involved yet more uh, thousands, more millions more uh, 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 deaths. And again, in turn, in terms, in terms of as a moral project, it failed to stop the Iraq war, etc. So even the architects, even the architects, key architects, Western architects of uh, these ad hoc tribunals <coughs> themselves didn't internalise uh, uh, the idea of peacemaking, not rulemaking. And then there's a the question of reconciliation. Well, if you look at any opinion, uh, um, uh, opinion polls, uh, uh, in Bosnia, uh, done for example by Janine Clark, uh, Sheffield University. What you see is opinion polls on, on the trials uh, uh, go along ethnic lines. That um, uh, and not only do do uh, has the reception of trials uh, gone along ethnic lines, but arguably uh, uh, in key respects, uh, the, what we see in the in the trials is law as a continuation of war and a tendency to uh, uh, reinforce ethnic divisions and the nationalist wartime politics. So who key gainers, ironically, key gainers uh, in uh, uh, former Yugoslavia, for example, have been nationalist politicians. It's great for them. It's much easier to talk about aggression 
and war crimes and genocide against us. Uh, uh, every side has its own uh, uh, genocide. Um, much easier to talk about the war than it is to talk about economic crisis. It was the E word, for example, in Croatia, that's been much, much harder to talk about the economy. It's been much, much harder to talk about in Croatia than uh, uh, war crimes. Um, so finally, uh, finally, I would argue that uh, uh, these, uh, both the ad hoc tribunals and the ICC um, haven't escaped victors' justice, although conducted in the name uh, of, of victims' justice. In key ways, we can see the pattern of the, pro the prosecution patterns of legitimising the power politics of the great powers, and even more worryingly, legitimising legal approaches now of concern in uh, uh, the global war on terror. Hearsay evidence, anonymous witness, closed sessions, etc., etc. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, a quick, uh, if anyone's ever done any uh, Google searches on how many people died in Darfur, what you notice on the internet is this huge raging debate of different commentators commenting about how many died, how many this number died, this number died. There's a really interesting quote from someone who worked for the Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs in Sudan, which said that no NGO has the capacity to give a figure. If an NGO gives a figure for Darfur, it's a political figure. Every person who counts and then claims their count to be true, it's a political act, not a descriptive act. As I think that's an introduction to Roni, who's the, one of the best people for talking about the politics of the figures. Um, thank you, James. I understand that you suggest that any kind of political assertion is necessarily wrong, is necessarily false. That's <laughs> that the underlying assumption of you. But I absolutely, I, I, I fully agree, any figure relating to the human losses in Darfur is by definition political. Let's just remember that there was an official figure about the, the human losses in Darfur, which was produced by the, the, the Sudanese government, which was amounting to 9,000. And there was uh, uh, another uh, figure which was uh, produced by, let's say, a human rights activist, I will say a little bit more uh, later on, which was, after a couple of years of war, which was about 300,000. So uh, there is a wide range of hypotheses. Uh, as a very moderate uh, person, I would say that I, I stand somewhere between these two extremes and my own uh, uh, conviction, not uh, because it is drawing on a number of uh, um, uh, assessments and invest, uh, epidemiological investigations which were carried out in, in, the, in the field and uh, the Center for Research on Epidemi and Epidemiology of Disasters uh, summarizes uh, the, the, the whole thing. The, the, the probable truth is somewhere between 60,000 and 100,000, uh, as I told them. Now, nobody knows exactly uh, what we count when we uh, go ahead with those uh, figures. Are we counting the people who, are, who were killed directly killed by shrapnels, uh, by uh, armed uh, uh, soldiers, or people who died in, from indirect causes, uh, fleeing, falling sick, uh, uh, starving, uh, uh, etc. There's a, a whole debate on, uh, on this. But now I'll move to the, the, the core of the debate, which is about uh, uh, genocide, uh, and saying that firstly, I think that uh, Mukesh should be praised for having worked uh, hard to raise awareness about what was going on uh, in uh, uh, Darfur, which is, in my view, uh, a very heavy-handed, very violent uh, uh, counter-insurgency war. Uh, but, of course, I don't think you're right, uh, my dear Mukesh, uh, uh, in terming it uh, uh, a genocide, and I would fully agree with what Vanessa uh, one of the things Vanessa said, which is that there was an overuse of the word genocide and not an underuse. And everyone wants to be a <coughs> or uh, a voice uh, person 
of uh, the uh, genocide. We want, if someone is killed by a bomb, this bomb has to be a genocidal bomb. And if you denounce the bombing, it has to be a genocidal bombing. Otherwise, it doesn't, it, well, everything seems to, to it, it seems that it doesn't really uh, uh, count. Now, let's consider the, the, the local and the overall uh, uh, context. The local context is a traditional uh, civil war. We, I think uh, historians might call it a national construction uh, war. Uh, Khartoum has waged wars against all its uh, peripheral uh, areas, the Darfur being the last one, the, the, the last one again this time, but uh, there might be uh, others uh, in the future, uh, unfortunately. And uh, the, the, the war followed uh, an attack led by the rebels, by the armed uh, rebels against the city of Fasha, and which was supposed to be followed by other attacks in, uh, in Khartoum. So there was a counter uh, attack which uh, ushered in a counter uh, uh, insurgency. Now, uh, the violence of what happened uh, during the first phase of the conflict uh, would justify. Uh, the, the, the concern that a genocide was uh, at the uh, onset. And after all, it was just 10 years after the genocide in Rwanda, and uh, Mukesh uh, rightly uh, recalled this. So there was good reasons to think about uh, genocide. But it soon became clear that this was not the case, and that we were uh, the witnesses of, uh, I would say, classical, cruel uh, uh, civil war. Let's just consider that for instance, one million Darfurians were living in Khartoum at the time of the war in Darfur. Not one of them was ever uh, assaulted, arrested, uh, uh, harassed uh, during the time of the, of the war. Let's imagine a Tutsi uh, in, in, uh, in Kigali at the time of a genocide, uh, let alone uh, Jews in Berlin or in other places at the time of the Second World War. So the situation is really uh, different. Another uh, interesting aspect, a uh, feature of this uh, uh, conflict is that, for instance, IDPs, you know, they were like, at the, at the peak of the war, there were like 2.5 million uh, IDPs. But it became soon clear that those people were gathering around garrison towns and looking for uh, the protection of the army. So uh, the army is perpetrating a genocide with the right hand and protecting the IDPs with the other hand. That's something rather awkward. And this is exactly what happened. Nobody seemed, but seemed to have bothered to ask the question, why the hell do, are these people seeking refuge uh, around garrison town when they are supposed to be uh, wiped out by the, 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 the Sudanese uh, uh, army? Of course, the, the dirty job was, done, was carried out by Jejaweed and by private uh, militias, but the, the big job in bombing and, 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 and a number of other things was carried out by the uh, 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 army. So this is, this is a second reason to uh, contest the idea that uh, a genocide uh, was uh, uh, going on. Now, let's consider the broader uh, picture. We are in 2004, ten, 10 years after the Rwandan uh, genocide, at the time when there was an electoral campaign in the United States. And this is, and I think this is, uh, uh, this is something really new, uh, Darfur, and an African issue more generally, became, uh, was at the core, or at least was occupying the central, uh, a key uh, strategic uh, place in the uh, uh, run up for uh, uh, the the electoral uh, uh, campaign. On both sides, on Bush's side, uh, it was about mobilizing the evangelical, the evangelist, uh, the Christian uh, uh, conservative over uh, a war uh, between uh, the, 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 against the Arabs, against the, the Muslim uh, fundamentalists. At one stage, people seem to have believed that the Darfurian were, were Christians. They were portrayed as Christian, which would have shocked uh, approximately 100% uh, of, uh, of them. But anyway, that was okay. Then they were, they were accepted as Muslim, but moderate Muslims, as opposed to uh, uh, fundamentalist, which is absolutely mm -hmm. false. I mean, one of the most fundamentalist uh, Sudanese uh, Islamist movement comes from uh, Darfur, justice and equality uh, uh, movement. And they joined the rebellion because they had been marginalized. Uh, after the victory over the, 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 uh, the 
the South. And on the Democrat uh, side, of course, the, there was a mobilization of the African uh, American, and Kerry was uh, Kerry's concern was to uh, get them to vote for him and to mobilize them around uh, this uh, uh, African uh, issue. And then all these people were joined by so-called human rights uh, uh, activists supported by the neoconservative. The neo and there was, of course, a revenge over what was happening in Iraq and uh, the things which were trying to drift away and going wrong uh, uh, in uh, uh, Iraq. So there were very heavy political issues around the war in Darfur, far beyond the limits of uh, uh, Darfur. Now, why does it matter? I think it does matter, uh, not, not for the sake of, the, of truth, which, by the way, uh, is not a secondary uh, matter. I mean, uh, we have to understand and, and put the right name on the right thing. But beyond uh, this, uh, it did politically uh, matter because uh, uh, hammering down uh, the, the, the issue of Darfur and trying to mobilize the international community against an, uh, uh, around an intervention, a military intervention. Let's recall that that was at the agenda uh, and, uh, in, in, in the UK, uh, probably more than any uh, other place, though in France it was uh, also at the uh, agenda. So the usual suspects, I mean the US, the UK and the French, uh, in terms of military uh, intervention, were uh, in the process of political mobilization. And as a result, this tended to radicalize the, the, the people. When you were in refugee camps in Chad, in Darfurian refugee camps in Chad, or in IDP camps in Darfur, people didn't want peace, they didn't, they didn't want relief. They wanted a normal intervention, they wanted to topple the government, they wanted to wipe out the, the genocide. Peace, no way, we want war, we want victory. So it was, it was a, a permanent pressure to uh, radicalize uh, things. And as long as this international mobilization was on its way, uh, it was extremely difficult it's, inside the camp to, to listen to any other uh, political tone than victory, uh, 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 military uh, mobilization. And the result was that there was a very harsh competition between various uh, armed groups and I must say that inside the IDP camps, it was not the military who were killing the people, it was the armed rebel uh, groups who were killing the people over a uh, fight for resources, uh, for uh, uh, recruitment of uh, combatants, uh, uh, etc. So this is, uh, uh, this is the reason why it, one, one I'll finish with the ICC, just as a, as a, as a wrap up. The former general prosecutor, Moreno, Ocampo, who was absolutely convinced, seemingly convinced at least, that it was a, a, a genocide, uh, dealt with this issue in a very funny and, and a surprising uh, way. In the, in, the, uh, in the camps, in the IDP uh, camps, where there was, the, there was an unprecedented relief effort, unprecedented since World War II, I mean, that was the biggest uh, uh, relief operation ever since uh, 1945, as a result, I mean, nutrition rates, death rates, uh, infant mortality rates were far better than anywhere else in Darfur. People were well nourished, uh, were, uh, had access to healthcare, to schools, uh, etc. He called these camps, and we, bearing in mind that when you have camp, concentration camp is not, is not far, and he called it a genocide by attrition. So he called the first phase of the war, which was the most cruel, the most murderous, I mean, the geno direct genocide. And the second phase, which was, you know, a low, uh, what was the name, uh, um, uh, well, less murderous uh, war, I'm sorry, the, the, the English name escapes, uh, 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 low, low intensity uh, war, he called it a genocide by uh, attrition. So we were considered, and I publicly, publicly asked, and I'll finish on this, I publicly asked to be inducted for complicity for genocide, because I was there, because MSF was there, had a huge operation, and we were participating in hiding the reality uh, behind, I mean, these nice images of relief uh, being distributed to the people. So all the, 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 the relief organizations should be collectively indicted for complicity of genocide, if there was a real genocide. Thank you very much. So I heard
hope uh, you've noticed there's a disagreement on the panel. Um, so, uh, on the one hand, uh, not declaring that there was a genocide in Rwanda in 1994, for many people, is one of the reasons that genocide became what it was. And on another position is, by saying that there was a genocide in Darfur 10 years later, that ensured that the war continued and was made more vociferous and more bloody. Two quite different positions. Now it's your turn. I welcome any questions, direct or indirect, or comments, um, either to an individual person or just a general uh, reaction to what you've heard. I've seen one hand in the middle here, and then one hand at the back, and then another hand over there, and then one here. So I've got four. Can I just borrow a pen? Sure. <coughs> so uh, uh, Bertrand, I noticed in the back here, and then the gentleman to his right. Um, Mukesh, you didn't actually tell us how to get away with it if you are a mass murderer. You told us how a mass murderer's um, action might have been ignored by a variety of people. Could you go, go back to the, the point of agency of the mass murderer and how they actually uh, engaged with this idea of, of with, with, a, with a pra the practice of genocide or indeed the developed strategy to get away with it? We'll take a, a number of comments before it. Uh, the gentleman in the middle here. Um, yeah. yeah. What, what part do members of the panel believe that politics play in uh, shaping either the presumption of, or, or the not presumption of genocide in Rwanda and the presumption of genocide in uh, Darfur? So the role of politics. And there was a question, I think, at the back right of that, yes? Yeah, particularly um, at Mukesh, really. The way that you present uh, your argument tonight, and I must admit I've not read your, uh, your book. It's available there. <laughs> um, I will buy it and review it for the salon website. Um, but the way that you present it is an almost after the event um, justification for Western intervention of some sort or another. Um, and I might be wrong. So it's really to open up that discussion. Because my understanding of um, what happened in Yugoslavia is a, a lot of uh, European powers disagreeing with uh, the future outcome of Yugoslavia and taking sides uh, on various uh, countries within the uh, former uh, Yugoslavia and encouraging them uh, if you like, to break ranks and start fighting amongst themselves. And then kind of after the event, uh, or after the trigger of ripping it all apart, uh, the West then comes in and uses the language of uh, genocide uh, and the monster uh, that arguably it created to then justify further intervention and ripping the place apart. So there is a real problem of outside influence. And the whole genocide uh, agenda seems to facilitate that. And I think uh, Roni was very useful in the way that he uh, explained how different parties within uh, a war zone would then use that language to uh, further invite particular Western powers of its liking uh, for its partial uh, end. And so that outside influence seems to have a profoundly problematic um, impact, whereas you don't seem to put too much emphasis on that. Could you comment? I'll take one more, this woman in the front, and then we'll return to the panel. Yes, um, I was just thinking, there's been a lot of discussion here on. Good speaker. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about what qualifies as a genocide, and it seems to be based on. Um, the events as they unfold and seeing whether they meet genocide criteria. I'm thinking more about warning signs. Um, and I, I think a lot of the things that, that freezes any possible helpful intervention is that when people say we are at risk of genocide, there may be a, a retroactive kickback. How can you say that genocide is truly awful? It's what happened in the Holocaust, it's what happened in Rwanda. Um, so I was just wondering, is there any 
Four excellent contributions. I'll, I'll open it out to Lukesh and then our other two speakers as well. Right, and try to address some of these things and also Ronnie's uh, uh, comment. I think it was, it was, it was uh, great, uh, Ronnie's uh, contribution, because he basically uh, illustrated beautifully uh, uh, the, my 12 excuses, uh, in a way. He, 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 as a genocide denier, as a, as a accuser of a, of uh, information as a kind of distractor and uh, all the other excuses. I think I use the word genocide. Actually, I never used it myself initially in 2003. Uh, um, uh, uh, I, I, I use the word ethnic cleansing, though legally speaking, the word has no meaning. Uh, actually, there's no, uh, nothing in law that talks about ethnic cleansing. Genocide is the only term in, in law as far as I understand it. Now, the point is, and this is where you really genuinely have to uh, read the book because this is not an attempt to plug the book, this is far too serious an issue. It was when a senior member of uh, Bashir's cabinet said to me, uh, and who am I? I am the United Nations. Uh, you know, I was the head of the United Nations, the senior most representative of the international community, not an NGO, representative of the Secretary General, the senior most, uh, uh, senior most diplomat. What I say matters in a way. Not an NGO, not, a, not an MSA, not an academic at the moment in time. It's important uh, that you, you must understand that. I was there in 2003, 2004. I was there before the attack on Al-Fasha. I was there traveling to Darfur. I had witness statements with my lawyers and human rights officers. I tested witness statements that ultimately went to the International Criminal Court. And the word genocide was actually used by the International Criminal Court. When they indicted, after a proper investigation, uh, uh, the president of, uh, of, uh, of Sudan on acts of genocide, they, they accused him of many things, crimes against humanity, etc., etc., but they made a particular mention of acts of genocide. So, of course, you might argue when they said that uh, the ICC is flawed because it's uh, uh, victor's justice, etc., though I can't see how the ICC is flawed uh, as victor's justice in, in the case of Sudan because the genocidal violence actually continues to this present day. I have no idea uh, how uh, uh, you know, anyone benefits uh, you know, from that. So I wanted to make that point. The other thing, point I wanted to make was that all the information you've got, Ronnie, is completely wrong. The completely and utterly wrong. I'm really shocked as to what the epidemiological basis is of that infection. If the people of Chad, and I was in Chad uh, last year, if they don't accept humanitarian aid and they want to seek uh, 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 justice and retribution, uh, justice and this is part of the human dignity condition. Is the fact that if they're sitting there happily accepting humanitarian aid, uh, does that mean that therefore they are not, uh, uh, you know, radicalized? I mean, I don't understand what your argument is there about. My third, uh, so I think that's just absurd argument. By the way, the Darfur genocide is not the last uh, act of mass atrocity, if I can call it that, in Sudan. What happened, what is going on in the Nuba Mountains at the present time, the Blue Nile, is not just a copycat of Darfur, but 10 years later, because the technology of war has improved in those 10 years, and Sudan is an oil rich country, it has, it, it has been able to buy sophisticated uh, 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 fighter planes, which it did not have in, 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 in Darfur 10 years ago. And I was there in both situations. I was in, I was in the Nuba Mountains earlier this year, witness for myself. You can see the film I made, etc., etc. So I think the cost of impurity has been to continue what has been now I call gen uh, uh, Sudan, Darfur, the most successful genocide. Even the Holocaust finished after six years, Rwanda finished after 100 days when uh, Kagame invaded, while Darfur continues to the, to, the, to the present day. Finally, one more point in relation to uh, early warnings and so on. Darfur was the first genocide of the media age. Never before, and, I, and I'm speaking as the head of the United Nations uh, you know, at, the, at the particular time, of whom the responsibility uh, lay. Uh, you know, never have we known so much about what was going on in real time, recording it and communicating it. Because we lived in an age of this, where I could fly over, over Darfur with my own plane, as at the United Nations, I had my own plane, I could fly anywhere I wanted to because I was heading the United Nations, I had a whole staff with me, and we were able to communicate, we were able to gather the evidence, and that's the basis, if you like. So I think early warning signs are, are pointless because actually anyone reading a newspaper can tell you what's going to happen. The issue is not early warning. The issue is the inability of political actors to actually intervene. 
Final answer to the question about uh, uh, how do we have to get away with genocide, I haven't answered that question, Yusin, but I think I have. The point is, the way you get away with genocide, if you're a political actor like Bashir or anyone else is, you say, here are the 12 excuses the world is going to make, and, and, uh, and this is how I'll get away. I'll confuse the world. I will kind of navigate my way through all these excuses and, and a divided security council and so on, and that's how I got away with, the, with, with, mass, with mass murder. I'm going to give Vanessa and Roni a chance to come back in a second, but I first want to hear from more comments from the floor. This woman here, and then at the back over here. I was struck by you using the term ethnic cleansing as a lay person, I don't work in this area, but it's always struck me as a really repulsive victor's terminology that cleansing implies making something better. And I just wondered if you can have views on the use of that as an alternative. One comment here, and gentleman at the back. Yeah, is it possible to separate an act of war from an act of genocide? Um, it's really a question for uh, uh, Keshe. Um, just in, in the case of Rwanda, you, you said that the, uh, the genocide in Rwanda lasted 100 days, began presumably on, in, in April 1994, uh, when the president of uh, Rwanda's plane was shot down, uh, and ended 100 days later. But the actual conflict uh, began in 1990, uh, when uh, the RPF invaded the country. Uh, from uh, Uganda, um, and it's it, it pretty much ongoing. Uh, from what I understand, uh, the Rwandan troops are still in the Congo. They, they pursued uh, the ex-government, the Hutu government. Uh, I think about how many, two million people died in that, in that pursuit? Well, that's not a genocide, of course, because they were killing genocide killers, which is, that was okay. Um, but how, how, you know, is it possible to separate an act of war from an act of genocide? Because What's distinctive about all these conflicts which are called genocide is that they're all wars. Whereas what was distinctive about Nazi Germany was that it wasn't a war. Um, they actually began with the communists, then it was the homosexuals, then it was the gypsies, then it was the Jews. You know, there seems to be a clear differenti differentiation there between a war and uh, a genocide. This, thank you very much. And this gentleman just here. Yes. Um, sorry, just, uh, just a question. I was wondering, I mean, what, what is different about Darfur in Sudan's sort of bloody history of micro conflicts and wars in the east and the south? I mean, it's something that I don't fully understand apart from the media spotlight on it. Um, because it seems as if the Sudanese government has always fought vicious ethnic based counterinsurgency operations and the sort of engin engineered famines. And just wanted to know what the panel thinks about it. I'm just going to take the gentleman here. It's a related question to the back, which is, I wonder how much the panel feels that the language of genocide is part of a, maybe one end of a spectrum, perhaps, of language um, like non-combatants, and other terms, um, particularly Western institutions used to describe and potentially uh, dehumanise war, particularly with the idea that I think there's a division also on the panel about how uh, prevalent the term genocide actually is, and whether perhaps the more shocking and horrific truth is the kind of... Uh, apathetic effect it can have in Western <coughs> British and European society. I'll take this one at the front and then I'll come back and come back to you. I have a question uh, that's related to what Roni was saying about um, factionalism in the IDP camps and the killings that were resulting and related to the question that was just asked about killings in Congo and Rwanda in retribution and how different these were from the slaughter in Nazi Germany. And what occurred to me then is you seem to be saying that there can only be a genocide if the victims are meeting some kind of standard almost for saving us, very passive, and they don't kill each other, and they don't commit any crimes amongst themselves. And so, as in the case of the <coughs> Jews just being led into camps, that was genocide. Uh, but had they perhaps squabbled among themselves and started killing each other, would you have made that same argument by me and said, oh, it can't be a genocide because look, they hurt each other too? Um, that sounds like a direct, I was about to go to Vanessa, but that's so direct to Ronnie, and then I'll go back to Vanessa. Ronnie, and then to Vanessa. The reason why I think it's not a genocide that happened in Darfur is not related to the factionalism and fight. Uh, that happened in the IDP camp, that's just life, political life, and, and uh, I'm not having any kind of uh, judgment. Uh, the, the previous reason, uh, that, that was just to illustrate the consequences of uh, uh, this uh, interna international moral mobilization where there was a very clear cut division be between absolute good and absolute <coughs> evil, the genocide being, of course, on the side 
of absolute evil once you've depicted one side as being genocidaire, well, you don't need to argue, you don't need to justify anything. It's just the evil and you've got to combat it, you've got to destroy it. Uh, to, to destroy it. And as a result, it radicalizes uh, everything. And one of the effects of this radicalization was this, this uh, struggle. Now, just to, to pick very briefly on what uh, Mukesh said about the refugees in, in, in Chad, maybe I express myself in a very imprecise uh, way. It's not about refusing uh, humanitarian aid. By the way, they accepted uh, cheerfully uh, humanitarian aid. So it was not about, uh, maybe I, 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 I turned it in a very uh, wrong way. The thing was that it was a UN and a US delegation uh, uh, that was uh, clearly uh, rejected when they were uh, trying to promote the peace uh, uh, agreement in 2005 and said, we don't want your fucking peace agreement. We want war. That's what we want. We want justice. No, 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 we want war. I'm <laughs> sorry. It was war. It was not about that. And then justice, of course. We want to negotiate with this guy because we want him to be in front of the ICC. But they wanted war. They wanted a uh, 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 weapon. They were sort of encouraged uh, to do that. Now, there's at least one point uh, I, I agree with you. On which I, I agree with you, it's about the warning signs. <laughs> it's about the warning signs. I, I fully agree with you that there's no uh, uh, need for uh, warning, for uh, prediction. For instance, now we are attending uh, a kind of ongoing quasi genocide in Burma. We don't need a warning sign. There is, I mean, the Rohingya are being progressively wiped out uh, in Burma and uh, uh, beyond the Rohingya, two other ethnic tribes. Uh, Muslim, <coughs> Muslim tribes are persecuted and, and harassed, and uh, maybe uh, with the promise of being wiped out of, of, the, of the country. So there's no need for uh, uh, warning uh, signs or uh, uh, predictions. But my point, and this is the reason why this kind of debate matters, is that crying wolf is counterproductive. And I think that uh, repeating that the, 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 the genocide, when they're keep, keeping alerting the, the, the world about a genocide when it's not, it's not a genocide, given the, 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 the moral uh, implications, uh, moral and political implications of this indictment is, I think, uh, uh, of uh, importance. And should I answer the, the other point? I don't know. Maybe oh, let's go to Vanessa and then we'll come back to Vanessa. Um, I'll just pick up on a huge number of points, but I'll, I won't pick up on them. I'll just pick up on, on a couple. First, first of all, this point about um, victor's justice. What, what I mean in, in that is in the broad sense that uh, the ad hoc tribunals and uh, there's been more than, than uh, Rwanda and former Yugoslavia, but the ad hoc tribunals and uh, the permanent court, the International uh, Criminal Court, um, are victor's justice in the sense that you have the Security Council uh, uh, having a veto on any prosecution. So any prosecutions there will reflect the concerns of, um, uh, of the great powers. That has been the, the context of a particular set of interests, political discussion at back and the role of politics. I would argue that what you have is a particular um, uh, historical juncture. You have a particular uh, uh, conjunction of political forces that supported the normative project of um, uh, expanding international humanitarian law in this area and expanding it in a particular way uh, 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 um, that I would argue has led not to the enhancement of international law, but as I'm, I'm concerned about law, I quite like law, uh, but I'm concerned about its degradation of international law, that, that the ICC reflects <coughs> a great power uh, uh, politics. It's not an antidote uh, uh, to that. And secondly, I think um, uh, when we look at uh, particular trials, particular prosecutions, um, and we look at the impact on the ground, that it doesn't, unfortunately, uh, 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 promote peace and reconciliation. It tends to polarise uh, the parties and, and uh, be antithetical um, to reconciliation. So if we look, for example, uh, um, and I think there's a real problem in terms of how 
um, cases are uh, constructed that um, promote the moral legitimacy of the interveners and don't ask fundamental, position, uh, fundamental questions of their role. So, for example, if we take um, uh, uh, Srebrenica and its tragedy, if we look at, and ironically, the very concern for ethnic cleansing which became a euphemism for genocide. And the whole sort of concern in Srebrenica, we want to prevent ethnic cleansing, we want to prevent genocide. So people were forced, my friends in Srebrenica, were forced to remain in Srebrenica because in the name of the international community didn't want to be seen as supporting ethnic cleansing. But believe me, if you were in, many of the people in uh, the enclave of Srebrenica were already refugees. They had no reason to remain in Srebrenica. They were refugees from outlying villages. They wanted to leave. But the international community, the UN, there's a lot to talk about the complicity of the UN failing to defend people. Much, much worse was that the UN forced people, like my friends, to remain in Srebrenica. And some of those, some of them were subsequently killed. Now how now, if we remember, those of us who are old enough to remember the debates at the time between 1993 and 1995, there was a whole concern of the West about the flow of refugees. And so we have, in the name of ethnic cleansing, preventing ethnic cleansing, the West um, denying refugees the, the right to asylum, the right to flee. So I think we really have to be look at the politics of genocide, and those of us who are, you know, uh, and uh, so I don't think there's a, if we're looking at, uh, uh, I think it's problematic simply to look at questions over the propensity of evil. I think uh, what we want to look at the, uh, uh, the propensity of not, uh, of, of duplicity, if you like, and that we can't look at these tragedies, the, these uh, 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 killings, simply in terms of the actors um, uh, uh, on the ground, and that's my core concern. The international politics of, of, uh, of genocide is legitimising uh, uh, the moral position of, of, of external actors and, and de delegitimising uh, uh, local actors, but also jeopardising the interests of the people in whose name uh, uh, they're supposed to be protected. Thank you, Vanessa. There's a gentleman just here in the middle of that, yes. Hello, good evening. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank our esteemed panellists for a highly stimulating uh, debate. Um, just two quick uh, questions, if I may. Um, if I may allude to Noam Chomsky's magnum opus, uh, Manufacturing Consent, the Political Economy of the Mass Media. I've noticed that Shwadi Assad's performances on the news do, does appear to be well rehearsed. And I was wondering, um, what role does the mass media play in introducing the term genocide into the public lexicon? Um, for example, the term terrorism has become ubiquitous uh, now, whereas this wasn't always the case. And a uh, personal question to Professor Makesh, if I may. Um, did you ever, did uh, Khalid uh, Mubarak ever uh, um, accept your dare? Um, I think recently in the BBC News. And you did dare him. Um, did, what, did you did it? dare him to. Uh, you've done, I think, sent some UN officials to uh, assess if there was genocide or some kind of ethnic cleansing taking place in, in Sudan. Mm. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Here, yes. It's, it, it seems to be a sort of consensus that the use of the actual word genocide is kind of problematic. Um, like I said, that. When it's used with, with authority, it's too late. But when it's used as it's happening, because of the media that we have, it tends to be devalued. And so there's a sliding scale almost of uh, not quite a genocide to absolutely complete genocide. I'm not sure you know, if, we can, if we can change that. And if it, would it be great if we could have some kind of standard when if it was issued, when somebody defined it, things happened. Yeah. Because I was thinking, uh, the panel could uh, 
could tell me what value you see in the term. Great question. I'll see if there's any more before we return to that. Uh, woman in the back, yes? This is related, really, and it's... I mean, I know using the term genocide has an imperative to act now, but what about the debates about applying it historically? I mean, the, the biggest case would be the, the Armenian case, where it's banded around an awful lot, these kind of sentiments that, oh, if it was recognised as genocide, then it might have prevented bad things happening later on. Not an argument I'm particularly convinced by, but I just wondered <coughs> your thoughts about that. Um, and of course, the person who has the greatest authority to declare something genocide is people like George Clooney, who's the one who was asked to stand in front of the UN uh, Security Council to make the announcement about Darfur. So if we're talking about people in our contemporary life who, who, who speak the truth, we invite actors to... So, to it. It. so that's another, uh, another part of this uh, equation. Uh, comments from the panel? Romy, I'll, I'll go to you in the end. Uh, almost, uh, there's a sort of summed up very neatly by the question from Tony. Take up the questions which were uh, you, uh, uh, before you maybe you can go for some of the okay. ones before, but right. I'll have to respond to the two here. Yeah. Well, there was an interesting question about the role of politics and politics yeah. the and determining the <coughs> genocide and, and the full, uh, uh, genocide. But let me recall first that there was a UN investigation commission, I mean, proposed by a legal uh, person, I mean, a jurist. Uh, if I remember when, June or July 94. Uh, in uh, Rwanda or around Rwanda, and in 2005 in Darfur, uh, their conclusions were, were quite uh, clear. There was a genocide, there had been a genocide in Rwanda, and there was no genocide in, uh, in uh, Darfur. So it's not only the politicians, it's also I mean, legal people mobilized by the uh, uh, UN system. Now, uh, coming, I mean, just trying to answer uh, a few other, uh, I mean, raising a, a few other uh, issues. I think that, I mean, obviously genocide is a legal concept. It's, it's, it's a legal notion. It was uh, uh, worked out by uh, a, a jury in a very specific uh, uh, context in 1944 in London. So it was in a very <coughs> special setting. Uh, it's both a moral and a, a legal concept in my uh, uh, view. And of course, it's closely linked to the Third Reich, to Hitler, to Auschwitz. I mean, this is the reason why it carries so many passions. And this is the reason why uh, it, when, when you use it, you indict uh, someone. I mean, the, the, the person who is uh, guilty of a genocide incarnates the absolute uh, evil. Not just a murderer, not just Kissinger killing hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese. Who cares about this? I mean, he is the, the absolute uh, evil. So there is a kind of uh, uh, insidious uh, moral hierarchy which is very uh, easy to explain when you consider the history of the term. But you don't have to consider the history of any word you're uh, uh, using. So it's, of course, used in a very, and, and, and you this is a very uh, uh, right thing. I mean, when you. It's too early or, or too late, uh, the, the way you put it. But one of the reasons is that it's a very vague thing, and it's becoming more and more vague since the Srebrenica jurisprudence, where any mass murder can be termed a genocide. Uh, uh, 8,000 people sparing, I mean, the, the children, the elders, the wounded, that's, and, and the women. This, is, this was supposed to be a kind of uh, humanitarian impulse, not the massacre, but the way, to, I mean, the, the, the sparing of those who were not supposed to be combatants, so the, those who were not supposed to be a threat. So those who were killed were the, were the young male between the, the age of 15 and 55. Uh, it's, it's an atrocious massacre. I'm not giving any kind of justification. It was absolutely uh, horrible, but to term it a genocide, is to open the way to call any kind of mass massacre uh, uh, a genocide. And as there is no prescription for genocide, Kissinger should be indicted for genocide, and, and, and Putin, and a number of uh, uh, other people, and French as well, in, in Algeria and Madagascar, uh, 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 etc. So it's a very heavily charged uh, uh, 
notion, and this is the reason why we have this meeting uh, uh, today, not about many other very grave and interesting and important situations, but about the genocide in Africa. And I, I, I fully agree, this is a very uh, serious uh, thing. It should be uh, it should be discussed. But now with, with the Strebalinsa jurisprudence, there is no more possibility to distinguish between a mass massacre and a genocide. And I think, and I'll finish on this, I think we have to to step back and try to think about situations of genocide in political terms. I mean, what was the process of discrimination? What was the process of marginalization which took place in the years before the massacre and the, 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 the process of wiping, wiping a, a certain group of people out uh, was uh, done? So this might uh, give us a kind of political account of what's going on. But the legal use of genocide now is absolutely uh, worthless. Absolutely worthless. Someone must respond to that. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I, mean I can argue with that, uh, obviously. But I think you have to distinguish the situation in Sudan uh, uh, from uh, the more philosophical discussion we're having here. Uh, uh, Ronnie, you're just completely wrong on the, on the facts. On the facts. And that can only be settled by actually looking deep. Like maybe some PhD student can, can, can do this. You know, from my insider knowledge, I would say that and someone asked, what is the situation in Darfur, that people were fighting each other uh, anyway in a nasty neighborhood. This, is my, this was my first excuse, uh, which is uh, that of, uh, uh, what did I say? Citizen, uh, anyway. That's how murderers get away. That's how you commit, uh, commit mass murder. Just because Sudan and people inside Sudan have been fighting, and the herders and the pastorals have been fighting for uh, 500 years, and climate change was making life difficult, and this and that and the other. Therefore, because there were complex factors underlying this, this is in genocide. You know, that uh, clearly is, an, is a specious uh, uh, argument. This is what you said. Uh, no, I'm not saying this is what you said, but it's one of the arguments that, uh, that, people, uh, that people make. I think, but my inside knowledge is what's in the book, which is that when I went to see the president of Sudan's office at the highest possible level, and they turned to me and said they would not sign the peace agreement between uh, the rebel group in the south, uh, uh, you know, which ultimately led to South Sudan's independence, the, the Nawasha talks, where I was representing the UN, so I was uh, very heavily involved in peace talks, etc., until <coughs> quotes, they would have the final solution in Darfur. In other words, they wiped out, you know, the the tribal uh, the tribal groups there. And when you plotted the GPS coordinates of the villages that were targeted, and you could do that, and I flew over that for got all the evidence. This is what led to the indictments. It was very clear that the nature of the violence that was going on was targeted on grounds of identity of a group of people. I, obviously, the people were in opposition, so it was certainly a counterinsurgency operation. But they didn't uh, mean that it, the techniques being employed were not actually targeted on the ground of identity with an attempt to eliminate uh, and a command and control arrangement. And all that was very evident to us you know, on the ground. That's why we spoke up uh, uh, when we do. On the wider issue of, uh, and by the way, on the question of intervention, very important points you made earlier on. Well, the lesson of history is that not a single genocide has ever been removed from position uh, without an intervention, usually an external intervention. You know, Hitler took the whole world to war to get rid of him. You know, the Vietnamese had to invade uh, Cambodia to get rid of uh, Pol, Pol Pot. You know, Kagame and his uh, Ugandan-backed uh, uh, exile troops had to come in to get rid of uh, the Hutu ex extremists. Uh, you know, I stand to be corrected, but usually uh, uh, to get rid of a gen genocide requires an, in requires an intervention. True, today's interventions are, we've learned the side effects of those interventions, whether they're in uh, Iraq or in uh, Afghanistan, and uh, one isn't, uh, or in Libya for that particular matter, which is not genocide in, in Libya, uh, or, or for that matter in, uh, in, in Syria at the present time. Now, but the point is that intervention doesn't necessarily mean just external intervention. There are four, and doesn't necessarily always mean coercive intervention. There are also, but there has to be resistance, if you like, a resistance that removes the genocide from power. Uh, I would finally end, I think, on this point by simply quoting uh, from my own uh, witness of what was going on. When I was uh, involved with some of the of the of these groups who were in mounting resistance and were also bringing testimony to my office in Khartoum, and I said to them, "We need a political settlement. You know, you guys need to be kind of uh, sort out the problems with uh, Bashir and, uh, and such." 
And then they said to me, did you do this with Hitler? This man has raped my wife, you know, uh, uh, burned my fields, dishonored my mother, uh, and etc., uh, uh, etc. Et and the litany of, of the abuses, I think, reads like out of, out of horror movie. That much is well known and well established. Established, uh, you know, not because of external intervention. There is strong evidence for this. So the, my point here, here, here trying to make is the best people to judge this are actually the victims. And if you don't take the position of those who suffer most, then this will remain an abstract and philosophical debate. And yes, the word genocide is useful and must continue to be used because unless we improve on it, and unless we improve on a better way of describing the complexity of what happens, we need a term like that. I do know that when I spoke up, uh, if you like to see, the Security Council acted in a way the UN has never acted in the history for, for 60 years. You know, within, within a, two weeks, the presidential statement, within three weeks, the Security Council resolution, within six weeks, the first peacekeepers on the ground. Too little, too late, because the ethnic cleansing or genocide were, were complete. But the point I'm here trying to make is, for the sake of the most vulnerable people, you know, and in the absence of a political world, for all the reasons that you've described, that politics is, is partial, it is, it is biased, and so on, we need some norms, some standards. And just because uh, things are not just everywhere, two wrongs don't make a right. I'm very sorry for all the uh, people who died in Serbia for the reason, for, in uh, Serbia for all the reasons that you described, uh, Vanessa, and that's terrible. Your, the story you described is outrageous, uh, what you said. I think it's wrong. What happened was completely wrong. But two wrongs don't make a right. The whole point about civilization, the whole point about prevention is that we're constantly extending the boundaries of what is not acceptable. And what is not acceptable is to, is, to, is to basically find excuses for the most vulnerable on the, on the planet, who cannot speak for themselves, who don't understand the language that we're speaking of, and argue whether their hurt is this extreme or that, or, or that extreme. Finally, on, on the preventive principle, sure, uh, if we don't, if we use a, a genocide word too much, then uh, it cheapens it and people won't understand it. And I say, why not? What's wrong with that? If you look at, look at our example in public health, Tony, you know, if you, if uh, there was the smoking campaign, you know, saying smoking will give you cancer, smoking will give you cancer, smoking will kill you. Of course, you know, only a small proportion of smokers will get, uh, will get cancer, and you can also get cancer without, without smoking. But it doesn't stop us from actually taking an approach, which is about preventing people from smoking. What is a precautionary principle in genocide prevention? Because unless we take those kinds of considerations into account, we'll continuously be debating historically and pathologically, in a way. And we'll continue to fail again and again and again. And that, in any sense, is uh, um, our mission is how we, can move, how we can move forward, rather than uh, actually kind of argue about the little bits and pieces here. And I, and I, and I think some of the legal debate may, may sound very abstruse, but it's fundamentally important for these particular people, because in the in the because the presence of a, a biased security council and biased international politics, the law is the only framework to which ordinary people can ultimately turn. However imperfect it might be, however imperfect maybe our institutions might be, that is that is an argument for improving, strengthening, fighting for the world and the institutions we deserve, not pushing them away with any with no other recommendations to take a particular place. I'm going to take a, uh, one question right at the back here. Gentlemen here and then here, and then I'm going to come to Vanessa. And you kind of made such a fun part of what I'm kind of looking for. You said moving forward, um, moving forward, particularly post Libya and what happened in the UN, and the fact that some actors who were involved in the resolution felt that the UN, well, some actors went beyond the meaning of what was supposed to be involved by. So what, would, what would intervention look like post Libya, whether it was in Syria or whether it was in any future crisis? What, what, in your, what would you say that intervention looks like? And again, um, one, of the, one of the mechanisms that would be having sanctions, I don't think we would necessarily touch upon sanctions, but going back to what Vanessa was saying earlier on, are sanctions actually useful or are sanctions actually making life even more difficult for the very people they're supposed to be there? So I, I'd like you to probably touch upon those two areas. Thank you. Excellent question over here, and then we'll come to the gentleman in the front. <clears throat> yeah, Mukesh, you get reality upside down. You said that um, the RPF and the Ugandans invaded to get rid of the Hutu extremists. Hutu extremism was a product of the invasion by the RPF, by the Ugandan troops. It is impossible to understand the violence within Rwanda 
unless you see it in the context of the war. Uh, and I'm just wondering, why is it that you just insist on seeing people as evil? You just assume that people are, are born evil. You know, the world, in your view, is divided between abusers and the vulnerable, the abused and the abusers. You know, but people are not born evil. <coughs> why is it a product of circumstances? Okay. First, I'd like to say I'm ever so glad that I made the effort to come in tonight. And uh, Mukesh, it's a privilege to, to, to hear you with you and argue with you. Um, the reason that you mustn't devalue the word uh, genocide is because it will lose its value. We've seen it happen so often with, with other words. And um, there's only a, a finite amount of resources that the world can uh, focus on problems. And if you have 20 genocides in the, in the media in six months, you will get less action. That's my opinion. And just to answer the gentleman at the back, I don't think because he's saying that, that we are all evil, but it is part of our nature to do evil things. And it's not that we're all going to do it, but I believe that that's right. I'm going to ask Vanessa to respond before, and obviously there's going to be responses from the other comments. I would argue that, uh, unfortunately, we still don't believe in um, uh, an international world of equality. And when it comes to victims, when it comes to victims, you're only a victim internationally if you uh, 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 um, if supported by a, a coincidence of um, great powers that when you look at the jurisprudence of international courts, when is a war crime a war crime? Well, it depends if it's perpetrated by um, a, a second, you know, second rate, third rate country, as opposed to being perpetrated by uh, uh, members of the Security Council. If we take, you know, a very simple example, um, if we take a simple example of cluster bombs, now, when it comes to Croatian Serbs, the use of cluster bombs on Zagreb constituted a war crime for which uh, uh, Milan Martic has been indicted. But whereas it comes to the same uh, 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 um, arena of conflict, the, the UN International uh, uh, Tribunal had a remit that could have encompassed war crimes conducted within the Kosovo War. And when it comes to the NATO, use of cluster bombs, that's not a war crime. There is a, so some victims are more equal than others. And unfortunately, uh, uh, the po international politics of war crimes, of international humanitarian law, in the cu current conjunction of, of, of political forces, means that, uh, 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 means that what you have is the taking up, the empowering of victim voices in support of a, 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 a Western perspective, primarily Western perspective, but increasingly it could expand to, to uh, other members of the Security Council, uh, uh, to uh, their concerns, their, their, their uh, understanding of what's happening in the world, uh, uh, and, and their understanding what they're supporting uh, uh, Western military events interventions, supporting regime, regime change or border change. So th th there just isn't this world of victim perspectives. There's, there's perspectives in which Western powers sometimes like to use victim voices to support their projects. In a very similar way that the World Bank's voices of the poor are constructed in particular ways that support the World Bank project that have very little to do with transforming the lives um, uh, 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 of ordinary people. I mean, in the end, war crimes trials are, are symbolic. They can only be, by definition, war involves killing, and by definition, it's not with, you know, uh, 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 doesn't involve due process that what one has in, in, in peace, peace times. Therefore, inevitably, even in the best of circumstances, war crimes trials will only be symbolic justice. But when we look at when we look at what it's symbolic of, actually it's really hollowed out. What one sees since 1945 is an enormous retreat from those ideals of a universal prosperity. 
It's in this context that we need to look at the meaning of justice. Somebody talked about the meaning of justice. And what's really striking about the 1990s and the whole uh, uh, expansion of concern and money to back it up, as I said, 2.3 billion spent on the war crimes court for, for Yugoslavia, very much less spent on, uh, uh, um, if one looks at, for, for example, um, uh, a remit around, uh, for example, Bosnian hospitals and medical care. You had a situation, for example, in 2008, 2009, four times more was spent on the ICTY than was by the international community than was spent on Bosnian hospitals uh, 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 and medical care. You know, let's let's uh, uh, look at that. Let's question. Let's raise questions about the meaning of a victim and how victims' voices are abused in international politics and are and, uh, 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 are being used to legitimise uh, uh, great power politics. Take another question before I come back to the gentleman here. Right, I think it's interesting actually that many of Keshe's points raised um, in his initial speech uh, really are uh, justifications for why uh, the opposite of his conclusion with regards to genocide being a term that we sh should use and should uh, need almost. Because really, surely the very ambiguities that you talked about in the, the um, diversionary strategies are a product of having such a term is so able to be manipulated by different actors in different contexts. And I wonder whether um, at the root of this is kind of the art of the possible of what the UN needs to have a definition of such a war crime and a, a, a gen and genocide to be used in uh, the International Criminal Court. And I'm, I'm just really wondering if we should, perhaps the route is to divide the, the punishment where you need these legal definitions from really the, the process of moving to taking action where we might be better off having some broader definitions um, based on actions rather than intent. I'm going to ask Moni to come back on either this point or the other point of place. I'm, I'm not sure I got your you, question. Could you just send it up because I'm not sure I understood it. Yeah, I'm just saying it potentially isn't there a, a, a distinction to be made between needing to have very defined terms about what we need by genocide, but by what we mean by genocide and um, war crimes in a punishment setting, in a post-hoc, post-event setting. And perhaps some of the problems of inaction are caused by institutions, particularly the UN, sticking to those, um, or political actors in general, sticking to those um, very specific definitions when what we really need is perhaps definitions based on the fact that violence is occurring on a large scale, rather than questioning the motives and trying to position um, whether something is genocide or not. Well, I, I think we, we shouldn't expect more than the UN can, can provide. Uh, and we should reproach them uh, not to do what they are just unable uh, uh, to do. So I think that sometimes UN is a <coughs> scapegoat, is a kind of uh, easy uh, body to, to harass, to, to criticize. Uh, when uh, other uh, political institutions, which are much better equipped to do something, just uh, stand by idly. So um, I, I don't think I really share your uh, critique or the underlying assumptions uh, of your uh, uh, critique. But while I've got the floor, I'd like to just... Can I? Can I? Yeah. Yeah. Can. Just uh, uh, underline uh, two... Uh, well, one paradox and one um, tricky uh, uh, issue. The paradox is that we wanted to uh, mobilize in 2004, 5, and 6. Uh, I mean, we, I didn't want, I mean, but the human rights activists or human rights so called folks wanted to mobilize the, the UK and the US, among uh, others, to uh, put an end to uh, what was going on in uh, Darfur when they themselves were creating turmoil and, and violence and, and, and an incredible chaos in Iraq. And uh, of course, from their part, I mean, from uh, Washington and, and London, there was a will to cover what was going on in Iraq with what was going on in Sudan and to, to take the guise of a justice man uh, <laughs> rather than the guise of a murderer, uh, which is what they were doing uh, in, in Iraq. And it was a kind of paradox with human rights activists trying to attract uh, the US and the, U and, uh, and the UK to re-establish justice 
uh, in uh, in Sudan when they were doing what they were doing uh, in uh, in Iran. That is the, the, the first paradox I wanted to add. So are we considering that there are kind of universal marshals that they are always right, even when they're wrong? This is the kind of things that are here uh, from you, uh, Mukesh. And the second thing, which is a bit more difficult to, to, to discuss, but I think it's important to, to raise this uh, issue, is what you said about the victims. Let's listen to the victims. Of course, we've got to listen to the victims. But what is the status of what the victims said? I mean, there are a, a number of historians uh, here. And I mean, histo historians tend to be more interested in what the criminals say than what the, 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 the victims say. I've, I've, I've made a film about uh, Eichmann and the Holocaust. And I gave the, the floor to Eichmann. And I think Eichmann teaches, teaches us much more about how, I mean, the whole thing was organized then the victims who were just, I mean, they were suffering, they're like, hell, but what could they say besides the fact that they were uh, suffering? So the criminal can, can inform us about the crime, not the, not the, 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 the victim. So this is the, the paradox I wanted to, uh, to underline. There's a comment in the back here. Sorry. Just to rephrase the question, Mukesh, um, the point that I was trying to draw out is that your focus on the city is uh, a focus on something that has already happened or is already happening. But surely the cumulative effect of the likes of you going wagging your finger at presidents of countries is surely going to rip countries apart as they look to outside uh, influences to help fight their cause for them. Don't you see that? Okay. Direct question to you. Well, I'll start with that and come back with the others. No, uh, I, it's not true. I think you are assuming that these uh, countries and their presidents are such fragile creatures that anyone waving their finger at them, they're going to immediately burst into tears and be ripped apart. It's not the case. It's actually not at all the case. And I speak from, I guess, about 20 years of experience in government, uh, including uh, as a diplomat the UN, uh, but also the British government and so on, you see. But these governments are very sensitive to international opinion. So the reason why, if we had intervened early enough in 2003 in Sudan, we might have uh, mitigated some of the worst consequences that happened was, because at that time, uh, Khartoum was very vulnerable to international opinion and sanctions and all those kinds, kinds of things, you see. see. So actually, it was very important to intervene, even by making the right speeches, in, in, in a way, and not doing anything, but saying the right words. Fundamentally important, because when the, we, and by the way, the victims can tell us a lot, uh, not to say criminals don't teach us a lot, but uh, you underestimate the amount of uh, wisdom that one can gain from the victims. And what the victims say above all else is, we know you cannot help us, but the thing we hate most is suffering in silence. Because our suffering then has no meaning. There is no heroism in sitting in a, in a, in a concentration camp, uh, sorry, an IDP camp in Darfur and quietly petering up. Uh, this then becomes a crime which has, no, which, has, which, which has no name. So on the contrary, if we were to actually wag our fingers enough, but consistently, unfortunately we don't do that in that system, we might have a, a, a better effect. Now, coming back, and, and I do know that it actually makes a difference in various negotiations, not to the level of genocide, but other, I remember Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone, I was very heavily involved uh, in, uh, in the Foreign Office. You know, 17 peace agreements took place before the one that held. It was the finger back wagging, ideally by the Africans themselves, that actually made, made, uh, you know, made a difference. Going back to some of the others, Hutus and Tutsis, I think I need to go back into the history. Uh, David, you were with me when we went to visit uh, uh, the shrine of uh, this Italian nurse, I can't remember her name or the location, uh, when I was there last year. My first return to Rwanda after uh, 1994, because I couldn't bear to go back to Rwanda. I was in Rwanda, 94, at the time the blood was still dripping down the walls, and the bodies were still rotting, and the dogs were eating the bodies. But, and I couldn't bear back until they just dragged me, partly for my own psychotherapy, uh, you know, 18 years later. And this is the shrine of the, of the nurse, Italian nurse, who stood up against the genocide the act that took place in the 1950s. So what you saw in 1994 was just the perfected act of genocidal type violence. I use my phraseology in inverted commas here. 
That had been practiced five years previously, 10 years previously, 15 years previously, 20 years previously, 30 years previously. And if you go back into the, into the basic dynamics of Rwandan uh, society and the Belgian administration, as well as the things that happened, 1994, uh, you know, 1994 Rwanda was bound to happen. In fact, the surprise was that everyone was, anyone was surprised. Because exactly the same thing happened, just it was in a practice area, uh, only about five years uh, before. And this struck me very powerfully. You know, all genocides are, are, are predictable, and all happen in situations where there have been previous uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, discrimination and xenophobia and so on. And this is true also in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Holocaust, in the Holocaust. Now, I agree with Vanessa entirely, and I think your most eloquent uh, critique, and I'm looking forward to hearing it all over again on, uh, on camera at uh, leisure. I think, you, brilliant, you've said it all. I think you, uh, I totally agree with you. We have a very flawed international system, where, which is unfair and unjust, and which is, generates problems in as much as it solves some. I totally, totally agree with you. But I don't know where we live. I mean, I, 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 where that leaves us. For me, that simply makes me even more mad and angry and to do, to work harder, to try and improve that. So for me, it is like a, you know, uh, it is like a situation, an imperfect situation, where we have huge problems, and this is the work of, of a generation to come. There's nothing wrong with the ideals of the UN, but your critique has indicated very eloquently that there's a lot of work to do. And no one has yet suggested a different set of visions and ideals that would replace the visions and ideals, which uh, we, dis we invented for very good reasons after two world wars uh, in this continent, which is the originator of some of, some of the uh, genocidal technologies, which were actually copied in, uh, in other countries. And we can come back to that in a bit more, 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 more time. So, so I think uh, that uh, I would uh, conclude on that by say, making one more point. No, I don't think that using the word genocide cheapens it. I think by bringing genocide out from the code and raising it into common discourse, and of course there are people who are going to use it carelessly, like, uh, you know, um, uh, you know I, people say pejorative things in the school playground or in the office or uh, all sorts of things, you see. It is because we hold the word, genocide is a serious word. If you, if I'm going by the actual definition, the official definition. Of course it's serious, not, I'm not making light of that, you see. But just because a word is serious, doesn't mean to say that it has to be kept in a museum and only to be brought out by sort of, uh, some kind of you know, deity, uh, legal deity or whatever deity. After the word cancer, I mean, you know, I imagine a few uh, decades ago, the word cancer was literally the C word we used to say, you see. And yet, it is only when people start talking about cancer, they understand risk factors, they understand vulnerability, they understand genetics, and they understand that they can do something, they, they can do something about it. And on that point, I would also say that all the studies of genocide suggest that genocide is not the extreme end of a cycle of violence. It is not a question of saying, you know, people do bad things to each other, and then matters get out of hand, and you have an atrocity. Then when loads of people are affected, you have a mass atrocity. And when that happens in a, in a war situation, it's called a war crime. And when it, et cetera, et cetera. All that can happen. But genocide is not a normal part of the violence cycle. It can happen in violence, it can happen in war. But conflict prevention and genocide prevention are not the same thing. The idea that you can actually prevent, violence, prevent genocide by actually investing in democracy and, and conflict prevention and all that. Possible, I mean, you know, these are good things to do. I'm not saying we don't do that. And this will prevent genocide. And therefore, the way to treat genocide is basically as part of kind of the normal repertoire of building a civilized world. That's wrong, uh, you know. Because yes, the evil, and this is what I mean by evil, just like a cancer can emerge even in a healthy body with no one smoking, so it is that, you know, genocide dull leaders will always arise in all societies. That's what history uh, tells us. And society has, will have to find means of resisting them. So genocide will happen again, and again, and again. But that's not a counsel for uh, uh, hopelessness. It is simply recognizing that uh, these evil things happen. And then to improve our systems and our ways of thinking and uh, inoculating our population through all the other, other means that, uh, that we have and trying to address it. Not hiding from it, 
not hiding from the word simply because uh, it is kind of painful to us. Because if we do that, if we put it under the, under, the, under the chair, then it will happen in silence, in the darkness, which is what happened in Rwanda, which is what happened in, uh, in, uh, in many other, uh, other situations, uh, in a way. No, speak about it, open it up, talk about it, even loosely talk about it. Uh, you know, it all helps to improve, if you like, the regime that has to happen. And one day I hope we'll have a better def definition of terms. The woman in the back here. First, I'd like to second what Mukesh said. I think that your uh, explanation on great power influence on tribunals is really telling, and it's really interesting, especially what I had seen. Uh, Libya became a major news piece once the European powers were afraid that they were going to have to be dealing with a large refugee crisis, as well as uh, French interventions in Rwanda uh, 10 years before. What I was hoping you could further elaborate on was whether the great powers, as you said, they spend so much money and are usually the ones who bankroll these organizations. Uh, do they tend to prefer tribunals simply because they view it as the most just thing to do, or do they view it because it looks a lot more sexier than, say, building hospitals in places and sowing long-term reconcili reconciliation efforts? It's a lot easier to sort of hunt down people and put them on display for everyone and then just call it justice despite what's have going on, on the ground. There's two direct questions here. I'll take the gentleman back, and then there's a funny distrust behind. Um, yeah, you, you seem to be historically literate in your understanding of Rwanda. I mean, in the late 1980s, the main fault line in Rwandan politics was between the northern Hutu and the southern Hutu. The Tutsi issue wasn't a particularly significant political issue within Rwanda. It only became a salient political issue as a result of the invasion in 1990. But again, you, uh, just picking up on another thing you said, you said that democracy can be a solution to um, a sort of genocidal politics within these societies. But again, what was the consequence of the promotion of democracy uh, within Africa after the end of the Cold War? Was it a coincidence that all of a sudden all these conflicts emerged in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Rwanda? You know, surely that was a consequence of the destabilization of these regimes with precisely this promotion of this human rights and democracy agenda. Um, Ronnie uh, made a, an interesting point about um, the value of what one can learn from perpetrators uh, as well as victims. Um, and uh, with that in mind, obviously, Mokesh's um, book uh, gives a perspective uh, from his position as head of the UN in Sudan. Uh, but there's also a short film on the Aegis Trust YouTube channel called um, Darfur Destroyed Sudan's Perpetrators Break Silence. And for anyone who is actually seriously interested in understanding what happened in Darfur from the perpetrator's perspective, I would recommend you take a look at that film. Um, it involves uh, Sudanese army commanders uh, through to January foot soldiers explaining precisely what they did in Darfur and how they did it. Um, and it's well worth a, a quick look. So do make a note of that. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those final questions. In a, in a second, we're going to uh, return to the panel just for some concluding comments. I, I, I thought I'd just, you know, obviously some sort of BBC uh, Dimbleby uh, crisis going on here in my first response to this is that I, I thought we'd do a BBC question time moment uh, and just see uh, from the show of hands the number of people here who think that the term genocide uh, is now uh, redundant and we should be looking for another term. It is overused. There's a few hands. So the majority think, think more that uh, this term should be used with more uh, intent and with greater... I don't know if I want us to keep, uh, spend our time looking for an alternative genocide when we actually need a response to genocide. So I don't know whether I agree with the second part of the okay. proposal. Um, I'm going to invite the uh, uh, 
panelists just to give, uh, if, if possible, a few final words, uh, two or three minutes each. I know, uh, obviously, they can't quite respond to some uh, good questions about uh, Syria, other questions about the history of Rwanda, uh, but uh, I invite them all to give uh, a few sort of uh, salient words to try and sum up some where this debate has gone. I'm going to start with Roaming to my left. Well, I took a bit of surprise, I'm not sure. I had uh, uh, many things to, to, to say as a kind of uh, rapper. Well, uh, maybe. Uh, I would argue that uh, genocides occurred even before there was a term, there was a word to, to term them. Uh, genocides uh, occurred in the course of wars. Uh, I mean, I mean, I haven't really studied uh, all the massacres across history, but this is my uh, impression. Maybe some uh, PhDs uh, could inform us about this. Uh, here in this room. So I think that uh, well, this kind of explosion of, of specific violence can only take place in the course of a, a broader uh, violence. So I mean, I, I think that we, I don't know what to think about conflict prevention. I'm not very confident that conflict prevention prevents conflict. Uh, <laughs> but I think that it goes into the right direction and that uh, maybe it, it strengthens the process of democratization. And I, I would argue that democracies in general don't wage war against other democracies and tend to not destroy uh, their own population. So whether it's uh, across the border or inside the, 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 the territory, a democracy is better placed than a dictatorship or a, any kind of uh, other uh, political uh, power to avoid uh, massacring, uh, massacring uh, uh, a specific group of people that is to uh, commit a uh, genocide. Romy, thank you very much. Vanessa? Um, I think when we look at the, the context and the significance of uh, uh, genocide um, today, that um, we need to look at the broader shifts at how uh, uh, war crimes trials shifted from uh, having a symbolic role uh, uh, in, in um, peacemaking in international politics to a much more substantial role in the 1990s um, and the context of a broader shift uh, particularly um, uh, in the um, architect societies uh, uh, behind um, uh, international uh, legal advocacy in this area, particularly that shift from politics to law. And actually, I was part of that generation that was disillusioned with politics, so uh, trained as a solicitor. There were many of us uh, 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 on our course. So you have that broader shift from seeking uh, a, a better world um, uh, through law. And I think what, what we have as well is, if you like, a crisis of the future where we find it very difficult to realise substantial justice in the present and in the future and therefore uh, we have an orientation to realising, attempting to seek, uh, uh, realise justice uh, 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 in the past. There's another aspect as well in terms of a whole sort of crisis as a sense of crisis of values, a crisis of direction, and in a sort of sense of a world of, of sort of moral relativism and, and, and um, anti-judgments, that, that um, uh, an issue like genocide represents a moral absolute uh, uh, against which we can define ourselves. In a sense, it, it's um, the domestic analogy that will be in Nottingham where um, uh, about five years ago, you had Nottingham um, was plastered, you know, I'm a good citizen, I don't get involved in gun crime. And, uh, you know, there's a bit of a bottom line with, you know, if a good citizen of Nottingham is a good citizen based on the, the, on the you know, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I don't commit gun crime and, and kill uh, 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 teenagers. If that's, you know, society is lost, it's a bit similar in the international sphere. If all we can say is, I'm not a genocide there, is that if that's how we define ourselves, that, that, that speaks to a crisis 
of, uh, of international uh, 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 vision. Um, Mukeshi says that said some nice words about agreeing with me, but I, I think I have to, but, but I have to depart again. My concern is that the the expansion of international law has not been a progressive development. Actually, it's been a, a, a degrading uh, a, a development that has undermined equality in the international system. That has recreated an international society of, of the civilized states against the barbarous. Uh, uh, societies uh, uh, that's just uh, that, that has reinforced um, uh, international uh, 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 hierarchies between uh, countries and continents, and that um, in terms of law itself, if you actually look at the law coming out of the legal principles coming out of uh, uh, the international legal processes, it's undermining uh, uh, human rights. Hearsay evidence, anonymous witnesses, closed sessions. Um, um, I think these are highly problematic for anybody that cares about legal justice and substantial justice. Thank you, Vanessa. Mukesh. Well, I think maybe 30 seconds. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> then I'll say nice no. to see you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I just wonder, Vanessa, whether it is the law or the or politics that is degrading whatever it is you said you are degrading. And just because uh, because things happened here in this country because of uh, the, the duplicities of certain politicians that we elected or they kind of changed, uh, from that one can't judge the whole worldwide system. All I can say is when I travel the world and I travel to the most desperate places because that's been basically my life, I know that the hope that which which ordinary people look to the international community. So don't make the mistake that just because we are on a downer in this country and we are badly governed by, by uh, you know, uh, politicians who are very selfish and this and that and all the other stuff, I'm not talking about uh, Thatcher. So uh, they, uh, we don't underestimate how precious the citizens of the world in other jurisdictions, how they look up, if you like, to the values and, and, uh, and institutions, imperfect as they might be. For them, uh, they have nothing in, in, in many cases. So I'm concerned and I'm a bit disturbed if your conclusion was that basically it's, it's all hopeless. The world is unfair, the institutions are unfair, policy is unfair, the law is evolving in a, in, a, in, a wrong, in a wrong direction. And I think that's wrong. You're wrong on facts. You're wrong in terms of people's aspirations uh, you know, out there. It may be that bad things are happening in our countries, but I think you're wrong if you think that's the way uh, things are happening uh, elsewhere. Now, second. Uh, I think, uh, let's get away from great uh, people, you talk about the great wars. That's old-fashioned uh, thinking. Gee, what great wars? I mean, Britain has a place in the Security Council and maybe it has an aircraft carrier still, does it? You know, uh, or two even, perhaps, you see? Well, you know, uh, nobody talks about great, great power politics up to the, in the wide world. Only the great power people uh, in the faded uh, powers talk about that. So yes, we have the Security Council, which is an ancient institution, and it'll rumble on because nobody can find ways of replacing it. But today's solutions, today's problems are not solved by great power politics. Of course, great power politics makes problems worse, but they definitely don't solve them, uh, unless there is a single great power basically uh, uh, imposing itself, and then it can impose a, a solution for a short period of time, and then whole thing, but, you know, uh, bubbles up. Well. So I see no, I see no, uh, uh, nothing useful in talking about great power politics. That's yesterday's politics, and we're seeing the remains of it. We have to talk about the new politics that, 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 are, that are emerging. Doesn't mean to say the new politics is going to be very good, or China is going to behave in a more civilized way than, uh, than uh, the Western, uh, uh, you know, West, uh, uh, traditional great, uh, great power. But I think we have to move on in our analysis of real politics, as opposed to the formal structures of, of great powers. Thirdly, I would say, what's wrong with conflict? I mean, why are we afraid of conflict? I mean, no human right in history, Ever since uh, you, know, you know, women uh, chained themselves up and wanted the vote, or uh, 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 people wanting the free association for speech, or you know, every single human right that is enshrined in various codes and so on has been won through struggle. Not just in struggle everywhere, but somewhere in the world, somebody had to stand up for those rights, and then they were copied by others, and they became norms. So and now we take them for, uh, for for granted. It is the nature of the human condition that progress and equality comes through struggle. 
And unfortunately, part of that struggle tends to be uh, a violent struggle from time to time when no other forms of work. What democracy does, and what Africa, did, uh, what post-colonialism democracy did in Africa was, at last, people were able to put their aspirations on the table. And part of the state building process, part of the historical process is to have conflict. Let's look at our own history in the UK. In the UK. Now that Scotland may, may disappear uh, its own, own path, and we can take it philosophically, but look at the history of this particular country, of the United Kingdom. It wasn't so united. It's only about two or three hundred years of history we are talking about. So when we judge, if you like, uh, these concepts and these things, don't make the mistake of, of uh, judging them in the, in the light of seeking instant solutions and instant things. For many people in the world, democracy, even if it means the freedom to walk down the road, to say a few words, to read a newspaper, etc., are precious freedoms. And that, in the end, is uh, the ultimate meaning of the word human uh, in the words we use, like humanitarian and so on. Let's not forget that. Finally, on Syria, 30 seconds in this case, definitely 30 seconds. And that is to say, what I was arguing for uh, uh, on the radio this morning was actually intervention of the non-intervention kind. The, the idea that now Hague is all very belligerent, wants to arm the rebels, uh, you know, uh, and in a populist movement because uh, Bashir is a, Assad has become a, 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 a devil. Uh, and no, this situation in Syria is not a genocide, at least at the moment. Uh, uh, so I'm saying that if you want to intervene, uh, you know, then intervene by not intervening. You know, stop arming uh, each side. Because the Iranians are doing the government, the, uh, the Russians are, uh, are doing whatever, and so on and so on and so forth. So non-intervention is a form of intervention. And what, I'm also, what I also said was that the reason the international system and the so-called great powers, which includes uh, uh, Britain and, and so on, are simply helpless despite their so-called great power status is because they have lost moral leadership. And uh, the answer is not a cynical answer saying the system is broken and the world is going to come to an end and uh, you know, this is it, but to say we have to reclaim the new, moral the, the new morality and yes, we need absolute morals on certain aspects. And I can't think of a, of a more important subject than the crime of all crimes, which is genocide, on which to have an absolutely moral position with no lack of, uh, of, uh, of compromise or clarity on that. Because we know what happens when you compromise. You know, millions die. Thank you.